say what? is calling The universe is calling me It speaks both day and night It's full of dark and light And I've heard
Hey, welcome to Skyto Livestream. Uh, it's a beautiful evening uh, just before Thanksgiving on the 21st of November. And we have a waxing gibbous moon, as you can see right here in front of us. Uh, I wanted to, first of all, say hello to everybody that joined us tonight. Uh, nice crowd for a holiday week. Uh, we've got Tim F. came in first. Yay! He made it. Cyclone right on his heels. And then we have uh, Irish Beach Boy 91. How's it going, man? Good to see you here. Thanks for dropping by. Sean, how you doing? And uh, we have uh, CND Boy and Fantasy is with us. You guys, man, you keep us going. It's just so cool. And naturally, Calibos is here with us. That's Mike. He's a friend. And uh, he's uh, really uh, something else. Gingus is with us as well. Hey, Gingus. Richard Spencer, how are you? Nice to see you. Um, and you know what? Uh, what's interesting about tonight is we have a, a waxing gibbous moon. So it's a, it's a bright sky. But <clears throat> you going to introduce me or not? Oh yeah, you know I, I probably should have, considering that you're you're you should already be live. Um, you're you're already live, Daryl. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, and that's Daryl you're hearing right there. Yeah, I was trying oh. to just uh, let people know what what we're gonna do tonight, and then I say I was about to say, and to do that we have Daryl Mason with us, and then I was gonna say hello, Daryl. <laughs> oh, okay. So hello, everybody, <laughs> gentlemen. Gingus. Brett Brandon is with us. Hi, Brett. How you doing? James Hyatt. How you doing? So, uh, as I was saying, uh, because it's a little bit of a uh, bright sky, we're still going to try and test and push the telescope just a little bit so we can get an idea of what we can see with the waxing gibbous moon. Um, it's a very fast system we're using. Our, our telescope runs at F2. And it's a 10-inch system. It's right there in front of us. You can see it right there in the building right there. And that, that, that telescope running at F2 is, uh, uh, well, it's about 300 pounds right there of, of pure crazy technology. I love it. I'm in Connecticut, which is all the way on the other side of the United States from that telescope, running it from here. And uh, it always, it's just amazing. I always think it's crazy to watch the roof slide off of this thing from 2,500 miles away. I don't know. It's just, it's a weird feeling to know that you're controlling something all the way across the country and it happens instantly. Now, at my end, I upgraded our internet here um, to uh, the gigabit internet. So I have, you know, uh, a gigabit uh, speed up and down. So they're the same in both directions because it's all fiber. Uh, optical fiber so that's pretty cool and that really helps out a lot at my end anyway i won't have any uh, dilly dallying of signal out in the uh building however this building is subject to starlink we are using starlink um and our power comes from the sun it's a uh, a building on the land belonging to a friend of ours who was a nuclear scientist uh, and he has uh, a full solar installation there and we get our power from that and it's the coolest thing so I want to talk about technology for just a minute sure I'd like to hear what you have to say well uh, the best seven dollars and 88 cents I ever spent this must have been 20 years or, or more ago Okay. I bought a little two foot tall fiber optic Christmas tree at Walmart. <laughs> and it's burned in my brain the $7.88 set it on the box. Well, that thing finally gave up the ghost. And I ordered a new one. And <laughs> I put it up this afternoon. And I missed my old fiber optic Christmas tree. It was, uh, it had a bright projector lens down in the, down in the base. Yeah. And, and an old-fashioned color wheel driven by an electric motor. Oh, you know? really? Okay, yeah. And it looked so cool because the colors, as the color wheel rotated, had kind of a turning, spinning, twirling effect in the tree, you know, the way the, the lights came out on the tips of the fiber optics. And the new one is just not the same. It's 
It's got LEDs built into the base, uh, three, I guess, or looks like three. And they just sit there and they pulse on and off electronically. There's no color wheel. And it just doesn't look the same. Are they RGB it, LEDs? Yeah. So they change color, but it's just not quite the same because... Right. Yeah. It just it doesn't have that spinning effect like the color wheel did. I can and, see what you're saying. Yeah, and I paid five times for this thing what I did for the old one. Uh, this 788, you know. Yeah. Go figure. <laughs> well, 788 30 years ago, right? I mean, come on. Naturally, yeah, it's guess. going to be it's a little bit uh, more expensive now. I want to say hi to Mr. Django, and uh, I want to say hello to Genghis. I think I said hi to you, though. And then Jane Murdoch is with us. Jane has been here at the bunker for Skyter live stream. She's a friend of the family. Um, and uh, she let me borrow a rock that I painted orange for Mars night when we were uh, doing our special on Mars. I had like four or five telescopes out in our front yard here and like 30 or 40 people here. We had a star party on the front lawn <laughs> and we were all looking at Mars and there was a lot of a lot of people that were confused uh, by the press who all are easily confused and because the press told them that Mars was going to be as big as the full moon <laughs> every year you know, every couple of years it happens when Mars is at closest approach right uh, and um, unfortunately uh, I had to break the news that that orange spot in the sky there was Mars. But I showed them the uh, the polar caps on Mars with the telescope, and I showed them some of the surface features of Mars. Uh, and it was really interesting, you know, that uh, to hear the reactions. Uh, one of them said, isn't that supposed to be a lot bigger? I said, if Mars was that big in our sky, uh, we wouldn't last much longer. <laughs> <laughs> You said uh, Mars looked as big as the full moon, supposedly? Well, that's what the, the media was saying, yeah. Oh, well, uh, uh, that was the case, actually, uh, back at the big Mars opposition, uh, 2003, I think it was, uh, that uh, Mars would look the same size as the moon at 71 power in a telescope. Okay, that's what they leave and out. That's what the media would always leave out. And yeah. they kept repeating that for years afterwards. Yeah, leaving out all the real reasons why. And people expect right. me to look up in the sky and see this big orange ball. Yeah. 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 Cyclone says, yeah. I think we should ban the moon. Well, I don't disagree with Cyclone, Daryl, to be honest with you. I think we should ban the moon. Or maybe we can actually uh, get Elon Musk to uh, you know, paint the moon with that special black which is the blackest black of any black ever right you know yeah. that, that black color in fact I wonder, Vanta black it used to be yeah i wonder i wonder if if they ever tried to um paint the starlink satellites with that that particular black color it literally reflects no light um or very very little light uh, but again they do need power, and they get power from the little solar panel, and I believe that's what you're seeing when you see the Starlink. They can't paint those black. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if uh, well, Mars is only twice the diameter of the moon. So yeah. if it was, if we saw Mars where the moon normally is, it would, you know, it would be twice the diameter is what we see in the moon. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Hang on one second. Yeah, it, it would be. Uh, so, I think that that's, uh, I gotta just do a little adjustment here. I mean, if you were standing on the moon and looked up at Earth in the lunar sky, it would be four times the size as what we see of the moon here on Earth. Oh, yeah. Because it's four times the diameter. Yeah, it'd be quite big. Uh, it'd be two degrees across instead of half a degree. Yep. Okay, so that's where we are. So, uh, 
Did you lose signal or something? I no, lost no, yeah, the need, I'll get you back. Don't worry. Okay. I had to, uh, I had to restart the uh, connection. But luckily, it's all quick now. So it's much, much easier to do. So let me just get us back up to where it has to be. Genghis has, uh, He's curious if the moon is just more gray tones under all that regular. Isn't the moon actually about the same uh, shade of darkness as uh, I thought I've heard asphalt? It's it's pretty. It's it's not quite asphalt actually, um, but certain parts of it is. I mean, if you look at the Maria, the darkest areas of the Maria are, but uh, that's that's actually. Uh, one of the problems that we have is that, um, unfortunately, the moon, all right, uh, is its surface is shaped by the uh, uh, radiation that's striking it too. So that's one of the issues, right? So uh, that tends to redden and blacken uh, objects. Uh, Irish Beach Boy says red, uh, and he's correct, all right? The uh, the ultraviolet radiation and, and, and the cosmic radiation striking uh, rocks that are totally um, exposed to that radiation will end up making uh, the moon look quite a bit more uh, red, uh, you know, or an asteroid. So it's actually pretty, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm doing five things at once, sorry. It's it, it actually a pretty uh, understood uh, phenomena. Uh, Oumuamua, for instance, uh, was thought to be quite reddened uh, by yeah. the cosmic radiation. Sedna is red, too. Sedna is red, yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Uh, I'll, I'll just have to look up the moon's al albedo sometime. Yeah. Okay. Let me get you back here now, Daryl, so that you can see what we're all seeing. Okay. Here we go. All right. All right, so Daryl's back with me now. I've got everybody here. We're going to be checking off uh, uh, a few items tonight just to check out a few things. Um, Can we zoom in on the moon before we leave? Yeah, yeah. I did focus, and what's interesting is that the, uh, the focus system is set for stars. And believe it or not, it's actually a subtle difference. Uh, between the moon and the stars. It's odd, uh, but I've noticed there's a subtle difference. It shouldn't be. I think I see the best the uh, trail from Messier Crater. Oh, over here? Uh, yeah, uh, down to the left. Uh, down in here? No. I uh, thought it was here. That's not it? I don't think so. I think it, it's... It uh, uh, just to the left of that. I, I think... Uh, well, this guy uh, right yeah, here, there it is. Yes, that and that's the trail going that's, off to the left. That's right, that's right. Or the splash, the ejecta. Yeah. It's interesting how how uh, cratering actually works, you know? Because I, uh, I, it, I do a demo. Uh, in fact, I'll be doing one um, probably in January uh, showing people how cratering works. Um, and, uh, it's pretty neat. It really is. I'm actually, uh, I'm finding that, um, I'm still frozen here, so I've got to do this one more time. Sorry. I'm not sure why that's happening. I've seen the film before. Uh, yeah. Some of it back in the days, like black and white film where scientists were, you know, creating craters. Uh, yeah. Uh, shooting high speed. Oh yeah. High speed uh, objects, or you know, like bullets or something, into yeah, a pile right. of sand, and uh, yeah. Doing it at different angles to see what kind of difference it would make. And oh yeah. Most of the time, they turned circular, no matter what the angle of impact was. Yeah, and. And that's uh, the reason that happens is the same reason that when you 
skip stones across the water, every single contact point where they skip across the water makes a circular, a concentric set of rings. And that has to do with the energy distribution uh, and the component of the rock, even though it's moving horizontally across the water, it's also striking the water downward as it's passing. And that, that downward doesn't drag to the side, all right, any of the water. It just imparts a force on the water right there. And that imparted force uh, will make a perfectly circular splash. That's why craters are predominantly round everywhere you look. The only one that's an exception, actually, is Messier which is actually a low speed impact. And so you can actually get a dragged out gouge. And that's yeah. what happened with the Messier object. Now the Messier crater could have been uh, two objects moving close together, striking the moon, or it could have been one object that could have skipped. But I think it was probably two separate objects, a binary uh, object. I thought they determined it was a skip. I, I, we looked at uh, They're not, the moon uh, yeah. from the Lunar Reconnaissance uh, mm -hmm. uh, LRO uh, yeah. one night, and we went right through the first crater and the second crater, and we could see a, a ton of detail on that. It looked like a, I thought it did skip, and then when it hit the second time, it kind of raised a big ridge up on the downhill side. Yeah. Uh, I... I... And, than the ejector pattern. I've changed my attitude about that a little bit, and the reason is because of the fact that uh, I felt that the if they were a single object, the bounce would have had to have been pretty strange for it to come out and go down so quickly to make such a large impact. I think it was two objects that moved uh, and struck. Now, I think a, a magnetic anomaly or a Gravi uh, gravitational anomaly uh, study would actually help us figure that out directly because we'd see the concentrations of either two objects or one object remaining behind because at that low speed they weren't all vaporized they're under there somewhere now that's the whole point right so. well, and I thought that's what we saw in the second crater there are a few other oval craters on the moon yeah, they are rare. I want to say Gassendi is one. I forget its name. Mm. Uh, it's over on the uh, like to the far left as we look at the moon. Yeah, probably in darkness still. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm I'm looking. Uh, you can bring it out on a YouTube bit. now. Okay. What are you looking up in YouTube? I'm looking at the screen. Oh. Yeah, let me uh, let me uh, change that. Uh, here we go. You say something was locked up. Uh, the the connection was uh, the connection was uh, wonky for a minute. So if I does it again, I'll just have to do it again. But it's not won't be a big deal. Okay, so let's see. Uh, oh, there you are. Yeah, you're back now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cyclone says okay. the moon is made of multi cheese and, and yummy uh, cheese and crackers. Anyone? Yeah, ha ha. Isabella's I, here. Yes. Yeah. Cosmic Ray's here. Yeah. Yeah, Ray is providing details on the Starlink. Let me uh, zoom out here. Let's just. Let's do something here. I'm going to... Uh, let's move it over. Let's move a little bit to the east here. I see Tycho. And I see Clavius down below Tycho. Yeah, right there. Yeah. All right. Let's do this. Let's move over. And now, let's actually pump up the volume and, and the gain. I want to actually show... The earth shine part, the part that earth is illuminating. And to see that, uh, you have to really pump things up brightly and increase the exposure wildly. And you'll eventually you know, be able to see. Here's a first star you can see out there. Okay, and now you can see the edge of the moon right there. It's going to get uh, brighter. 
and more visible, I should say, as I pump up the volume, pump up the volume, that kind of thing. So there it is. There's that right there is lit by the reflected light coming back off the earth. It's not lit by this here. This isn't even visible to this side because it's around the curve. Okay, so this is the other side of the moon uh, as seen here. Um, the It's not the dark side. It's the unlit portion of the side facing us. Whoops, Bonnie got heart. Bonnie? Bonnie's here. Okay, nice to see you, Bonnie. Nice to see Bonnie here as well. Always. Yep. <laughs> Gingus, pump up the volume. That's right. <laughs> well, there you go. So there's the uh, moon uh, in that regard. Uh, what I'll do is uh, show it to you like this. You can see the other side pretty clearly there. Uh, and, you know, for the people that think the Earth is flat, you always have to say, well, then why is the moon round? This is clearly an illuminated ball. Okay, and if we actually reduce our exposure a little bit, uh, it becomes even more clear that that's the case. Uh, so I don't understand why uh, people do that. I think it's just to to make people crazy. That's my only thought. Yes. I, I don't. Uh, I don't think that they. They. I don't think uh, they do it on. I think they do it just to be uh, confrontational and controversial. Uh, I don't know. I've heard some of them. They sound like they just really, they don't have a good grasp on what they're seeing. Uh, mm -hmm. I've heard some say, you know, well, look <clears> at a rocket launch. That rocket's going down. <laughs> and it's not going down. It's, it's you know, it's uh, not going vertically. It's uh, it's, it's moving going, toward the horizon is all it's doing. It's going down range as it goes into orbit. And so right. it gets closer to the horizon eventually. Hello, Bowinkle. How you doing? Haven't seen you for a while. Glad you're back. Francis Palmer, likewise. Nice to see you as well. Now, uh, Francis has a good question. Do you think the moon was captured or made from part of the Earth? Well, okay. First of all, uh, the capture process uh, would have been very involved. Uh, that's not to say that the, the impact of the Mars-sized body on the primordial Earth that might have splashed out the moon uh, isn't involved if we if we reduce our uh, our gain here again and go back down to a gain of zero uh, I can show you when we look at the moon again here uh, one of the things that we see on the moon everywhere are all these craters though the moon has all these many craters for some reason and that some reason could be what many people think is the what's called the early bombardment era uh, there were two bombardment eras and when the moon was first created um, if we go to that scenario a Mars sized body struck the earth and that collision sent large chunks of the molten earth off into space which kind of broke up into molten balls that circled the earth and for a period of time we had kind of a ring around us um, but then the moon started absorbing all those extra balls. In most cases, they were doing impact. So there were tens of you know, trillions of these little tiny asteroids slash meteorites, uh, meteoroids that would strike the moon. So it actually caused a lot of the craters you see. Um, and some of the bigger ones, like here, okay, if you notice that's circular, there's a reason. If you notice this is circular, there's a reason. Same thing here and here. These are overlapping circles. And there's one. So these are giant impacts that actually broke the uh, the early crust of the moon and just caused flooding of uh, basaltic lava from inside uh, onto the surface. So the magma deep in the moon got, got brought to the surface by these impacts that broke up the surface. Uh, so that's something that is... Uh, uh, in uh, a theory that actually has some pretty good foundation and merit, we can tell about how old these are because when you actually zoom in, you'll notice some things sort of, sort of like this. You'll see that there's there's craters on top of these dark uh, things that were once just giant pockmarks on the moon. So why are there so many craters? Because they came after this event. Okay, 
So that's how this works, right? So uh, we can tell the chronology of crater impact on the moon by looking at the craters and what they lie on top of. Now, interestingly, and Daryl knows this, we've talked about this, the side of the moon we see right here is actually the thinner side, the meaning the crust is thinner on this side. We don't see any of these dark maria on the other side of the moon. That's all lunar highlands with mountainous regions. There's very few areas. Uh, Sokovsky Crater, the Aiken Basin, uh, being uh, uh, obvious different areas. Uh, those, those two areas are uh, the closest thing to Maria that we see on the other side of the moon. It's mostly highlands. Now, why is the crust thicker on the other side of the moon? That comes from that early impact theory when the moon was first formed. And that's some of the strongest evidence to indicate it was formed from Earth. Okay? Because when the Earth and the moon were still molten, all right, the Earth had a lot of infrared radiation pushing off of it, going toward the moon. And then remember, the moon's a lot closer to the Earth, right? Much, much closer. And so what it did was that radiation pushed any further impacts on the moon pushed all this stuff further over the lunar horizon onto the back side of the moon. So the back side of the moon over time accumulated more stuff. All right. So what that means is that uh, seeing the difference in thickness tells us that the moon and the earth formed uh, or the earth formed uh, and then the moon formed from the earth from an impact. Uh, that's a very big telltale sign. I think that was understandable to you guys. If you have any questions, go ahead and ask. And we definitely need more focal length, yes. Sure is pretty, though, isn't it? It is. And um, so here's what we're going to do. Now, uh, now that we've checked it out, we're going to go and look at something else. There we are. Okay, so where are we? Ooh, we're in Aquarius. There's Saturn. There's Saturn. We can try and take a peek at Saturn. Eh, I could probably see the rings. I think we could. Probably see a few moons, too. I think we could. But we'll see. We'll definitely see Titan. Yeah, we got other good stuff down there under Aquarius. And... Yeah. Uh, when we see Titan, you'll see that it actually looks a little orange. Because we're actually going to see the, basically the atmosphere of Titan. All right, hold on. Let me just... I had my... This was on too loud. <laughs> I actually had my speakers on. Okay, let's do a, a one-second shot here. All right. Let's see if we've got Saturn in here now. It's going to be close. I have to uh, just get us aligned a little better. I'll try to find Saturn. It might be up here. If I can't find it from this way, I didn't have to realign the scope. I didn't do that tonight. My mistake. Isabella, give it a try. What's she saying? She has a question, but it's too long to type. Okay. Yeah, let's go to measure two. And we'll come back to Saturn here in a sec. There it is. Okay, so... That's measure two. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull up our crosshairs. And we're going to move it in. So let's head east. All right. Measure 2 is a globular cluster. Uh, these are known as halo objects. They actually orbit the whole galaxy. 
plunging into the disc, uh, through the disc, and then coming back up through the disc. Uh, they may shed stars when they do so. Um, and they may actually um, gain stars as they pass through too. It depends. But there's a lot of space between the stars. They can actually come through and not hit a darn thing. What's Ray saying about the chat window? Okay, let's get this up here. I think he's telling Isabella to type it in 20 chat windows. Oh, I looks see. Like a, looks like a shift arrow or something. Uh oh. Okay. Oh, okay. She's asking about binary objects. Binary asteroids. Yeah, well, Ultima Thule is a binary asteroid. That was a surprise, but uh, it was kind of cool to see that. And uh, they're called contact binaries. And um, the reason that they're, they're, that they're contact binaries is because they were once binary asteroids orbiting about each other. And then they ended up just through interactions and uh, probably some uh, mass loss or gain, they started to uh, get closer to each other. And that closeness, that process ended up creating a, uh, a point where they actually touched. And when they touched, okay, even no matter how soft they touch, there's still a little grinding that occurs. And with icy objects, it means that they melt momentarily in that spot and they cement themselves together and then they orbit as a binary object. So Ultima Thule is like two pancakes connected at the end. Uh, it's really a, a weird object. That's the one that the New Horizons spacecraft uh, went by after visiting Pluto. You remember Ultima Thule, right? Sure. Uh... They gave it a name. I don't remember what it is offhand. Well, Ultima Thule is its name. That's the name, that its actual name. Well, no, there was another name, Erikoth or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, let's... Uh... Ooh, let's look at a globular. Yeah. So what would uh, do... Michael has a question for you. Okay. Let me uh, first make sure that Isabella... Uh, gets her question finished. So it's possible. She did. So is it possible Earth and Moon were once the once one and separated in many in a long time? Um, I I don't believe so, Isabella, because uh, what's happened is uh, we've noticed that the Earth is slowing down, uh, and that's because the Moon is spiraling away slowly. That has to do with a complex interaction in the gravitational forces between our uh, ocean bulge and the moon's uh, surface and in, in concert with the sun. So um, as the ocean bulge moves along, it actually, uh, it, it's big, okay, and it kind of gets ahead of itself and kind of tugs a little bit on the moon, giving it just a little bit more angular momentum, uh, moment to moment, uh, to the amount of... Uh, just enough speed to move it away about between two and three centimeters a year from the earth so yes whereas it's true it's spiraling away as it does that it's robbing the earth of angular momentum um because the moon's gravity is also pulling on that that ocean bulge and now the earth is fighting that so it's slowing down ever so slightly so we had a four hour day when the moon was first formed and the moon was quite close and then as it, as it spiraled away it, over time, we end up with a 14-hour day, 18-hour day, and then 23 hours, 56 minutes, kind of where we are now, roughly. So I think that's um, I think that's the kind of thing that uh, we want to uh, keep in mind. Obviously, that you know, we see all kinds of evidence of a formation hypothesis where the moon was suddenly created, and this is one of those uh, data points. 
I hope the Earth's a the Earth's axial tilt uh, yeah. quite possibly came from uh, the uh, impact on the moon, That's, the Thea impact. Yes, Daryl's right about that too. That's why when you look at other planets, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Your uh, your Uranus is on its side. This axis is tilted over ninety degrees. Eighty, yeah, it is. It's like I thought it was like eighty-nine. Oh, uh, something like that. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, uh, Mars has quite a similar axial tilt to the Earth. Yep. And so does Saturn. Saturn is twenty-six some odd degrees. We're twenty-three and a half. Yeah. Now, just a little quick thing about Mars too. We have Phobos and Deimos. Now, when you look at Phobos and Deimos, they look for all intents and purposes, like asteroids. And it's possible that Mars did capture Phobos and Deimos. All right. Look at that. That's, look at Mission 2. That looks beautiful. It does. Yeah, that's really pretty. Wow. That's a really nice picture. Let's let's let, let it process. Let's see where it likes to be. Okay. And Ray said, uh, uh, big game of tag out there between objects. Sometimes you stick, sometimes you break apart. Uh, yeah. You could imagine, you know, a violent impact is going to turn one big asteroid into a lot of little ones, or uh, maybe right. Earth and a moon and a lot of uh, meteoroids. Uh, sometimes you get a gentle impact or. You know, where they just kiss each other and, uh, yep. like Ultima Thule, or, uh, sometimes they don't quite stick together, but they do orbit each other, like, uh, that recent, uh, binary asteroid discovery. Yeah. Very true. Okay. Um, nice globular. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's M2. As we said, and let's actually darken our background up a little bit. Let's also try uh, this. Yeah. You can see a lot of extra stars in there. By altering colors and shifting our color curves down here, sometimes we can actually see uh, some differences. And we can shift the curves manually if we want to. But that's really nice. I'm going to actually drop out a little of the red here. I've noticed that the moon will enter and cause some red light, uh, an overabundance of red light for some reason. Uh, Michael says, don't forget my Facebook group question. Uh, what was your Facebook group question, Mike? I he might said, uh, real uh, question real quick. Does Mark have advertising on by default on the STLS Facebook group page. He get pillow and shoes. Oh, I know. I, I notification until I turned it off. I, I don't want those, so I, I got to get rid of them. I don't know. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. I can't do everything, unfortunately. But if you uh, know how to do it, feel free to let me know. Yeah, because I'm always deleting and banning whoever puts that stuff on. But I don't think they're actually members. I think they're just somehow doing advertisements. Or bots. Yeah, exactly. Isabel says, It was a very interesting study that the orbiting and all these forces can cause objects to split. Uh, they even went further to propose that maybe some stars become binary the same way in the early stage. Uh, that would have to be quite an early stage, long before they actually have uh, fusing cores. Um, they would have to still be condensing matter at that point. And if it's rapidly spinning, it can separate out into separate blobs that could then each individually become stars. Yes. That is also true. Okay. Measure 2 is really cute. I like it. It's really red. Yeah, I know. Uh, I color corrected it, but with the moon, it's... Uh, yeah. Okay. The moon, uh, the moon causes a color cast on everything. What you can do is just like do something like that. 
you know, uh, and maybe even, well, it's still going to be red. But if I, if I just pull this red down on the right here, that's just a little bit. Yeah, it is what it is. Hey, Rock. Okay. Rockstar's here. Yeah. So that's cool. But these clusters are just uh, unimaginably large. And you might ask, well, why are they being held together as a cluster? And since we know that there are supermassive black holes in galaxy cores, it's logical to ask, are there... Um, are there also black holes in globular clusters? This would imply, because we know there are many, many globular clusters uh, in in a variety of um, uh, in a variety of, uh, of uh, galaxies, we know uh, that if that's the case, it means that there were a lot of black holes created when the universe was created. Uh, and these are called primordial black holes. Um, but as you know, we've talked about, we know that black holes also evaporate over time. So they have to be really massive to have not evaporated. Or they would have to have continually been fed <laughs> with other material and matter. And that's also possible. Do black holes take like trillions of years to evaporate? Depends on their mass. A, nano, a nanosecond is all it is for a micro black hole. But if it's a bigger black hole, then it will take longer, yeah. And you can calculate the evaporation time based on the activity of a black hole and its mass. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh... Ray and Isabella are saying that the uh, Facebook chat is missing. Um, let's go look while I'm here. I don't know. Let's find out. Hmm. I guess. Yeah, where'd it go? <laughs> I'll have to bring it back. I don't know where it went. Okay. Let's go back to our... Now, uh, this is the reason why our stars are staying perfectly round. Okay, we're using the full width half maximum filter. So, if the star diameter is smaller than this number of... Uh, and we'll call it pixels for now, uh, in, on average, then... Um, the stars will be added that frame will be added to the stack otherwise it won't it's a very still night so we've we've stacked 26 and we've ignored none so we have no no red uh no red stars no i'm sorry no red frames here yeah. being there beyond our maximum much better than <coughs> the last stream yeah but we still managed to get like six to eight you know yeah Cosmic Ray asked if I got my Facebook page back. Nope. Um, I made a whole new one. You know, I realized that all the friends I had on Facebook, you know, it doesn't really matter. They'll come back. You know. So I created a new page, and now I'm much more selective about who I accept uh, as friends. Okay, we're going to name this. This is Measure 2. Alright, and... Uh, if we go out and look at this, okay, it's also known as NGC 7089 or Melot 235, and its distance is 12,000 kiloparsecs or 39,000 light years away. That could easily you know, give you an idea why it looks so small. Now, if we, if I show you the actual size. Got on 25% here, you can see that it's actually pretty small in the sky, considering that measure 13 is like this big in the sky. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so this is really kind of small. Well, still enough for uh, 
Messier to pick it up in the Florence telescope. Yeah, I mean, the smaller an object is, yeah. the more it compact. Was just a, it was just a smudge to him. He didn't see the stars. Yeah. yeah. Speaking right. of the stars, though, if you zoom in on that again, uh, it seems like even with the red cast yeah. from the moon that uh, some of the stars there in the outer part are distinctly redder, more red, and... Yeah, I think you're right. I know we've seen uh, uh, old star, you know, cl they're cluster members, but they're crossed in the line from the main sequence to a red giant. Yeah. I think we see those sprinkled around. Yeah. All right, so this... Now, as far as the red cast, I, uh, I don't know... Uh, what's going on in the camera that gives it a makes it a red cast uh, but it's it's definitely not really uh, a red cast so we're not getting an accurate rendering of the color uh, right now but that's okay Michael Hedrick's trying to ask you a question okay Brian Cox number one we may be the only life in the galaxy and number two he would not be surprised in the slightest if an alien ship showed up uh, <laughs> so for him to say well we may be the only ones in the galaxy but I won't be surprised if an alien ship shows up uh, you can't have it both ways <clears throat> first of all I think that they're here to be honest with you and uh, the reason I say that is because uh, doing a, a uh, the talks I do on the, on the physics of interstellar travel that they may be using uh, is actually pretty enlightening and I had people after that talk it's like the, the, a light went off in their head this is holy cow this, this, they can be here you know and I think that's pretty interesting um, so I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that they've made it here and I mentioned this before, um, they're probably carbon-based for reasons I've talked about. And if they're carbon-based, they need oxygen. So what are they going to do? They're going to look for a planet like their own. They're going to look like look for a planet that can support them, right? Because we're doing it. So why wouldn't they? For all the same reasons, okay? So they would find a planet that has oxygen in its atmosphere. And since we have been pumping oxygen into our atmosphere consistently for over 2 billion years, okay, it means that we would find that any civilization within 2 billion light years effectively uh, with the capability to travel hundreds of thousands to millions of light years uh, in a, a, a short time might look at us as a probable target. To go and check it out and if they're here they're probably scientists i do believe that and never forget when the balkans were flying by earth that's right they were going to ignore it until they detected a warp signature on the planet that's right near the planet yeah that's otherwise right. they would have kept right on going yes so it would have been just a log entry that's right. We we got into the we got into the Vulcan history books. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that was uh, what's his name, Zachary. Oh, what was his name, Zachary? Uh, oh, Cochran. Zachary Zephram Cochran. Yeah. Yeah, Zephram Cochran. Yeah, he was he was that guy. Okay. And that's one where they kind of broke canon. Uh. Even uh, within the old Star Trek universe, uh, uh, if you remember on the TV show Zephyr Cochran, he was a real straight arrow astronaut type, clean mm -hmm. cut, clean shaven. Yeah, yeah. And then by the time of uh, Star Trek First Contact, uh, he was a hippie. He was an op <laughs> he was an alcoholic bum. He looked like <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. I guess that's because the companion left him. Uh, Remember that? Or he just hadn't met yet. Yeah. Okay. I want to take us up north here. Uh, were you going to try for Saturn? 
Oh, yeah, that's right, wasn't I? Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. I did say we would do that, but when I went to it, it wasn't there. Uh, and I just forgot to go back to it after we... Uh, you should have synced on him, too. I, I synced on this here. I synced on M2. Okay. All right, let's go back to Saturn now. Thanks for reminding me. Sure. Okay, let's go. All right, let's see what we got. There we go. Telescopium Maneuverosa. <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing a 15 second exposure here, so it's not going to look right until I do this. Go back to one second. There we go. <laughs> Saturn's leaving a smoke trail. No. All right, well, let's see what we got. So we're going to go a little bit to the east. And then. Oh, we'll there's the good old halo. I thought the halos were a thing of the past. Oh, no, no. No, they're, they're still there. Unfortunately. Uh, Isabella, uh, I saw your questions. I wonder what telescopes the advanced aliens use, and then uh, how do we envision the future of the telescopes? Uh, they already are <clears throat> at least discussing the concepts of uh, really huge uh, telescope arrays, interferometers out in space. Yeah. Like, say, you took 100 web telescopes and spread them all around, uh, you know, a million mile synthetic aperture. What could we do with that? And that's kind of the direction they're going. Uh, they're presently building the extremely large telescope down in uh, down in South America, Chile, I think. And uh, I think Parnell. Yeah, it's close to the uh, European Southern Observatory. And... Uh, it's the biggest telescope on Earth, or will be when it's done. It's got a 39 millimeter aperture, if I remember right, and uh, that's you know, really not millimeter. You meant meter, didn't you? Yeah. Did I say millimeter? 30, <laughs> 39 meter aperture, uh, and that has probably about as big as you'll ever see a telescope on planet Earth. Yeah, radio telescopes will be a lot bigger because you need more uh, data uh, for the longer wavelengths to actually build an image, so they will be bigger. And she says, but what about a thousand years from now? That's a good question, Isabella. Isabella asks a good question. She does that. I know. And uh, she does some really cool stuff for us. Hey, look at the rings. Yeah. Well, you can see the rings and the separation between them. Now, obviously, we need more focal length. This telescope, again, is a wide field system. But the fact that we can see Saturn as good as we can is actually uh, uh, quite an uh, accomplishment for this telescope. Uh, you may have heard that uh, oh, there were some misleading media stories about this recently the rings are going to disappear in a year or two uh the rings have been closing since uh all for the last seven years maybe uh uh it's what we're seeing is the rings seem to turn edge on and disappear for a short time and that's when it's uh spring on Saturn that the sun is over the equator on the planet Saturn mm. and uh, when the rings are open at their maximum is when it's uh, solstice on Saturn winter or summer solstice yeah so the rings are opened their pres open their maximum angle to us 
But right now it's approaching spring on Saturn. <laughs> and for the record, uh, this is Titan. I don't even have to look in the Stellarium to know. Titan is showing up here. It's a very, very large moon. It's planet-sized, actually. Yep, it and, is orange. And it's orange, just like we expect. There's another one right here. Let's go to Stellarium to see what these are. So we'll zoom in. And Saturn's kind of low, so we're not getting the best view. Okay, but there's Titan, like we said. And now as we zoom in here, I'm going to guess that this is what we're looking at here. All right, this right here. And that's Rhea uh, that we're seeing there. Let's go back. Yeah, that's Re out there. So we have Titan and Re and Lost in the Glare, we have the others. Yeah. Now imagine if you're a, a, well, I guess in the 1500s and you're looking up in the sky with your simplest of telescopes that you made, all right? And in the 15 and 1600s, that was very simple. And you notice that they were just moving back and forth in front of the planet. And sometimes they would seem to disappear and you would maybe think they're going behind the planet. Are they? You might think they're going in straight lines or you might theorize they're going in an orbit. Kind of like we knew we were, you know, uh, we had the sun orbiting the earth at the time. That's how they thought. But then you announced that, well, no, actually, I think the sun is the center and the earth is going around the sun. And I recognize Saturn as the outer solar system sun for that system and all those little planets that I see out there are going around Saturn too you know and then Saturn's also going around the sun as well imagine if your religious dogma uh, said that the earth was the center of all things and you started talking like that well such is what Galileo Galilei uh, encountered when he first started observing the moons of Jupiter and seeing what they were doing. And um, it Eper si muove, as Galileo said. And yet it moves. Yeah. Yeah. So, pretty interesting. Let me, um, let me just uh, take our gain back down to go back to looking at Saturn's rings one more time. They don't have to reduce the brightness here. Uh, Chrysler asks a question. Uh, is Titan still considered our solar system's best chance to have active life? Uh, I think Titan's too cold. It's way too cold. At least for life as we know it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you're talking hundreds of degrees below zero on Titan. Yeah. I, I think Europa's a better choice, uh, Christopher. Thanks, by the way, for that question Christopher Thompson um, Europa is a better choice and that's a Jupiter a lot closer to the Sun only five astronomical units away but uh, consider that Titan uh, has liquid methane and ethane on its surface and uh, it has a rich nitrogen atmosphere and the reason that Titan is intriguing to people that study the history of life on Earth is because Titan is sort of a snapshot in time, uh, not for the temperature so much, but for the ingredients more so uh, of the ingredients we had on our planet. So it's very interesting to look at Titan <clears throat> and think about how it was on Earth back when those types of ingredients were present on our planet in such amounts. Um, and Titan being nearly planet-sized is not an unreasonable study partner right Europa is only 2,000 miles across 1920 or so and that is not as nearly as big as Titan of course but Europa has a ocean underneath and it's theoretically uh, possible that if you could get to Europa you could swim in that ocean and depending on how deep you go it might be quite warm it might be rather reasonable. Uh, life as we know it could exist under the ices of Europa. But on the surface, that's, that's 
outer space to creatures on Europa in, in Europa's oceans um, because that would spell certain death if they were to be expelled through a hole in the ice uh, but we see uh, we see hydrogen, water, we see carbon dioxide being expelled by Europa through those fissures and cracks. So we know there's an active environment going on on Europa. And the reason Europa's got it is because, you know, of course, it's going around Jupiter. But Europa also has Ganymede, Callisto, Io, all right, or, and that are also orbiting closer to Jupiter. And the tug from those little moons is squishing io a little bit making it do this see squishy squishy and that kneading process k-n-e-a-d-i-n-g that kneading process heats up the interior and keeps the interior uh melted and and so it's not just a, a cold moon and in its core it also has the radioactive elements of formation just like the earth which is part of the reason that planets have molten cores in most cases because in the beginning during the time called differentiation that, that highly radioactive heavy uh, those heavy elements drifted toward the center of the planet while it was molten right and obviously some was left out because there's turbulent eddies and stuff that's why we can find uranium uh, and other uh, radioactive elements in our crust right but indeed it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting uh phenomenon uh, and so this is this explains why we see uh, planets that are so far away and so cold yet could possibly su you know, support life it's because of that that needing and that that uh, radiation from or original uh, formation so I think now that uh, uh, it's either Ganymede or Callisto or both of them I think they may have a uh, oceans under the surface on them as well yeah i thought about uh you know ganymede is actually very big it's bigger than mercury and um so it's truly planet sized but if you think about ganymede it has a surface that's entirely icy so why would ganymede not have the same type of uh possibility afforded to it and it might it may very well have uh, potential life underneath its surface too. Now, what kind of life are we talking about? It's not photosynthetic life, life that requires the sun, right? Um, and the reason we thought about any of this at all as being a possibility has to go to uh, the uh, 1970s here in the United States at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution with Project Famous. And uh, they actually went to these deep ocean locations and they found the uh, these black smoker chimneys the hydrothermal uh, vents and they noticed that in these hydrothermal vents there was life in these hydrothermal vents in like little oases and it was like amazing that life could exist there so um, that led people to think well maybe if life can exist there Life might be able to exist uh, elsewhere, at another location, uh, somewhere else in the uh, in the universe. And that's exactly why we think now that there could be chemosynthetic life uh, underneath the ices of some of these uh, planets, or moons rather. This is the double cluster. I'm going to bring it in closer here. I should say uh, centered up more. Because um, I want to show you something about the double cluster. Uh, something I started to talk about the other night, but I think is important to really drive home the point. Now, we think of all star clusters as young, hot stars, right? And they can... Many people think that these 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 uh, star clusters will live billions of years like the sun. Well, it depends what kind of mass they start with. And as Daryl has pointed out many times, and as I've said a, a number of times as well, 
in this cluster you'll see that there are some red stars and these are actually in the cluster so why what are they why red stars with these hot blue stars well again go ahead well, same thing i said with the globular cluster i mean uh uh they're of an age where they are moving off the main sequence becoming red giants right and it has to do with their mass uh it it's not an age thing it's actually their mass so, uh, well, their age and their mass. Yeah, a star that's, for instance, an O type star is going to live maybe, you know, a very hot O star might live four to six million years. And it goes from hydrogen fusion, hot and blue, to a red supergiant in that short amount of time. So, its mass determines how quickly it burns through that hydrogen, its fuel. So, here we see the same thing. These stars, many of which are, are these O stars that have formed in here. A lot of them have gone to red supergiant stage. Now you don't really see it here, uh, but we'll take a photograph and you'll see it a lot easier here. All right, so let me just uh, set this up here. Uh, as we look at the new clusters, you'll see that uh, the red giants tend to be over in the uh, left-hand cluster. And I think because of that, they think the left-hand cluster is older and it's closer to us. It's slightly closer. You can see there's a little more dispersed than that one than the one behind it. They're approximately the same size. Uh, they're only a, 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 like 200 light years. The one on the right is only 200 light years further distant uh, or so. But this is only going to be a short 15 second exposure. It doesn't have to be very long to show all this. So we'll get the stack up here and we'll delete the previous object which was measured two all right and down there you see the progress bar which tells you that the exposure is going when it reaches the end there the first exposure gets done and that image shows up all right and boom there it is and it's very clear you can see those stars very very clearly there's red stars here 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 they're they're everywhere <clears throat> so we got uh red stars there uh, that one might be in there too this might be in there we got this one we got that one we got that one we got that one okay we got that one <clears throat> and more so i mean we've got lots of red stars um there's one right there in fact and this cluster that might be and this one these two might be in this cluster but superimposed because it's closer you know so there's a lot of these beautiful red stars and that those are as Daryl pointed out highly evolved stars and their mass determines how fast they evolve so a cluster doesn't have to be uh, a cluster is always necessarily um, um, a collection of stars that may or may not stick together <clears throat> so these may stick together they may not they may drive apart but it's so young that it has yet to do that but the stars are massive so they've had the chance to evolve to red giants really beautiful cluster though that's more of the right color right there Brandon Hill says uh does density ultimately determine color and temperature of a star <clears throat> because hot massive blue stars turn red and cool down when they expand into supergiants, although mass doesn't change as much as volume? Well, actually, that's a, a very good question. Um, first of all, there's something that with all stars we have to consider, and that is that every star is losing mass every second. Uh, the energy they put out is more than just light. Okay, it's uh, solar wind, it's protons and electrons liberated from the plasma that is in that outer envelope. So that's mass. And every second the sun loses tons and tons and tons of mass. But because it's so massive, it won't ever run out. All right. Similarly, with larger stars, they can have mass loss that's stupendously huge. Um, and there are stars that are... Uh, 
I wouldn't say normal, but very strange, called Wolf Rayet stars. And they're like 20 or 30 times as massive as the sun. And sometimes they expel multiple suns of mass off of themselves and still continue uh, fusing uh, in their cores for a period of time until they're going to actually reach a supernova stage. So the stars are... It, it, it's not just the density. A bigger star is going to be more dense in the core, yes. Um, the color is determined by the temperature, all right? And, uh, and that relationship is known as Wien's Law, and it relates the temperature with the, the, the predominant wavelength coming from uh, the star. And uh, so temperature makes, makes the color, all right? You can have red hot, which is more than hot enough to kill every single one of us watching this. And then we can have blue hot at the opposite end of the scale, which is so hot that you wouldn't even know what killed you. <laughs> it would just be too, too, uh, too hot for you to withstand. So it's more than uh, the temperature. Go ahead, Daryl. Get a heck of a suntan first. Yes, as Daryl points out, that's very true. You got a lot of ultraviolet radiation, which is up in the blue end of the spectrum. And that stuff is going to come, you know, raining down on you. Um, and there won't be any, there won't be any sunblock that will actually help you with that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and okay. To expand a little bit on what Brandon was saying, uh, Brandon, uh, as the star ages and it moves off the main sequence from uh, using hydrogen to heavier elements, uh it uh, the star expands because of the uh, the temperature of the new fusion reactions, I suppose. Uh, but uh, that's when it expands and it turns red because it expands and cools off. Right, the gas is farther from the core, and the actual reason for the expansion, I can I can tell you, um, when a star runs out of its primary fusion products, let's say hydrogen. As the star starts to run out of hydrogen, okay, the core is fighting a constant battle uh, against the gravitational force trying to collapse it by outputting radiation. Okay, well, as it outputs radiation, it reaches an equilibrium state where it's putting out as much as the, the force is trying to collapse it. So it balances. Our sun's in equilibrium. Okay, but if you run out of hydrogen, now the gravity's winning out and the core is collapsing. And when it, gets, when it collapses, you're trying to take matter that's already moving around at extreme amounts of speed. Uh, and you're forcing it closer together, colliding more, and you're causing temperatures to skyrocket. And when you do that, you get an outrush of radiation that causes the outer layers of the star to bloat. <laughs> okay, while that collapse is occurring. And so that puts that puts a star into a red giant phase, um, and that's after running out of hydrogen. All right. So then, when you're in a red giant phase, now that core collapsing continues to collapse, and eventually might get hot enough, like at a hundred million Kelvin, to start fusing helium into carbon. And when that happens, that in some stars, that's a rapid onset. It's called the helium flash, and then the star takes on a new life it turns a little more toward the blue end of the spectrum all right and then when it runs out of helium it again collapses in the core and bloats again to uh, a red giant again and goes up another similar path as the previous one and and so it's it's a very complicated stellar evolution uh process and and this nucleosynthesis we're talking about but it all relates to making sure that in the end all the materials in the star end up being returned to the interstellar medium to start other stars and other potential worlds elsewhere you know who knows where this cluster was uh, formed it, it might have been formed at this location in space or it might have been formed somewhere else uh, but it was formed from materials that had previously uh, been ejected from a supernova and open clusters are often not massive enough to maintain themselves 
over very long periods of time that uh, open clusters will tend to uh, sort of dissolve over the course of time. Right. Uh, Michael Hedrick, I'll just answer you. Do bigger stars always have bigger planets? No, no relation whatsoever. There's no relation to uh, bigger stars having bigger planets. Um, in fact, uh, some of the smallest stars can have bigger planets than our solar system have. Uh, those are the M-type stars. They're about maybe anywhere from uh, a half to a hundredth the size of our sun in output. And uh, some of them are only slightly larger than Jupiter, but they can have planets around them that are uh, a substantial portion of the star's diameter and size. So it depends on a lot of things that we don't even understand yet, actually. So this is pretty cool. This is a beautiful double cluster. Uh-huh. I'm gonna, uh... I'm gonna go back and name this again. I was just looking at I was just re doing some research on a double cluster today. Um, and uh, it's really got an interesting uh, history, where it comes from and how it formed. Um, but these stars, those red supergiants, are actually, uh, 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 as you pointed out many times, they're all part of the cluster as the cluster has evolved. So that's exactly what's going on in here. Let me zoom in. Because look at that. That's really something. You can see those red stars quite clearly now. Look at them all. That is something else. Wow, that's a showcase. This, by the way, is you can see this with your naked eye. Um, and let me show you where it is in case you want to go out and look for it. Yeah. You need a dark sky to see it naked eye nowadays. Yeah. Binoculars help. Yeah, but if you look at the W of Cassiopeia right here, okay, this W of Cassiopeia, you go to the end star, and then you you follow it down to the, the to Murfak here in Perseus, okay. If you go to the end star, you look you look basically, yeah, uh, let's say which if if it's now in the northern hemisphere, uh, this is a out where it would be and then you look kind of to the right and you look for that bright star and then about a third of the way down just off center you're going to see a fuzzy spot in the sky um, I can see the double cluster from here in Connecticut uh, without any problem because my sky is not totally light polluted um, but out there in the Sonoran Desert where the telescope is located <clears throat> you can see it by looking directly at it. It it doesn't look like a fuzzy spot. It looks like a double cluster. Just small. So it's really pretty. Mark, would you excuse me a moment, please? Sure. We're going to head to a couple of things uh, uh, after. So when you come back, we'll already be there, Daryl. Very good. Surprise me. All right. All right, so... So the double clusters there. We'll just uh, do this save here. I think we're going to probably have had a hefty number. Yeah, we haven't. We didn't have any problem with any of our values yet. And nothing, nothing went haywire on us at all. Perfect guiding, perfect stars. All right. So we just did it. And when you get this, if you go up to our site up there at the top, see skythroughlive.org up here. You go to skytherlive.org, and if you scroll down, you go to Take Me to the Cool Pictures, and you can get this picture. What's it look like? It looks like what you'll see now. There it is, and you double-click on it, and this is what you're going to get. You can take that down, enjoy it, make it your desktop background. You'll find that it actually uh, really uh, does well with magnification, and you can actually use it for what you want. And you can, uh, and it's all free, by the way. Oh, Isabel, don't worry about it. And she says, I forgot the links. 
it's okay all right so that's up there now so what we'll do is we're gonna uh, go back to our uh, one second uh, imagery here okay and this gives us the opportunity let me uh, make sure we're good here all right there we are. So now uh, we can go to another really cool nebula that's over here. Now with this, the moon out, I've been anxious to try this. This is sort of a, a fainter nebula. Uh, well, we're going to try it. It's called the Pac-Man Nebula. Remember? Waka, 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 waka. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's the Pac-Man. And we're going to go there. <clears throat> and see see how it looks okay it's right there <clears throat> so I'm just gonna move it over you can kind of see the red nebula now which is kind of neat gotta head west a little bit go west young man hey there Sam S how are you I wanted to thank you guys for coming out on this in this holiday week. Michael Galea, how are you doing, man? Nice to see you as well. Oh, thanks, brother. It's very kind of you to say that you love our views of the galaxy. Okay. Now, as soon as we take a long exposure of this, you will see uh, how it looks just like the Pac-Man, the classic Pac-Man. All right, so let's do that. We're going to set up a, this will be uh, 25 seconds. That should be good. And at 200 gain, that should work fine. So uh, we will stack this. And for those who may or may not remember what stacking is, uh, it's a very simple process. Basically, we take an image and... That image is taken, then a second image is taken. It's aligned star to star, nebula to nebula, with the first one and placed on top. And we make this image sandwich. And that means that all the data that are things like the nebula are gonna come out brighter and brighter. And if there's dark patches in the nebula, those are gonna come out as well, okay? And they're gonna rise to the top as well. And that's what we're looking for. So there is the Pac-Man Nebula right there. Waka, 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 see? And um, I'm going to uh, just do some, get some processing here. It's actually got uh, quite quite a lot of red nebulosity in there. And we'll just move this over a little bit. And then we'll let that clean up. So the first shot looks a little noisy, right? But as we take more shots, it's going to get better and better and better. Okay. Yeah. Marianne Rob is watching. Uh, Marianne is part of Skyter Livestream, as you guys know. And she said, I just saw you're going to the Pac-Man. Yes, that's right. But why didn't she come into the chat to tell us about everybody that she was here? Now she will watch. There should be a Miss Pac-Man. <laughs> there was, right? Game-wise. Yes. Hello, Lubo. How are you doing? Nice to see you here from China. <clears throat> yeah, over in Arizona, Lubo, it's uh, in the western portion of the United States. It's actually... Uh, it's dark. Where you are, it's not dark. Look at it. This is a beautiful Pac-Man. Now, with a waxing gibbous moon, it's really, really interesting to uh, uh, to be able to get a nice shot like this. But we're using some special filters that allow us to do that. Uh, hello, Zergzon. How are you? Thanks for joining us. You guys, make sure, you know, if you're new to our channel, please do, you know, hit the thumbs up, join us. It's all free, you know. We also have a Patreon. If you want to support our Patreon, we have a small but growing list of supporters, okay? So you might want to 
consider becoming a Patreon member. Our Patreon page is up at skytourlive.org. You can see what we have to offer up there. Uh, so you can check us out. Um, and then uh, we, uh, like I said, we actually have a number of people that have joined us. These are our patrons at the moment. And um, we could always use more. Uh, this telescope we're using is the one that's out in Arizona in the desert. We have another one here. Um, and that one is going to be done uh, proper once we can get the building. Uh, and it's going to be a little enclosure for it. It's not even going to be a building. It's going to be modular so we can move it. <clears throat> and that'll be uh, another one for the East Coast. And then we're doing a third one out in the Arizona desert as well. Or in Arizona somewhere. <clears throat> and we're looking forward to uh, getting that one up and running. And uh, thanks to our patrons uh, for supporting us. We can do it. As I promised, Marianne is Rob. Marianne Rob is here. Ha ha. She wanted to hide. Yeah, well, she can't hide. No more. <laughs> yeah, but see now, you see this dark nebula in here? This dark nebula, that stuff is, is actually the stuff from which life is made, right? So let's zoom in on that a little bit because we can do that now. We've got nine shots, nine stacked images so far. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Very dark blob all by itself up toward the upper left, son. Right, and that's what I was going to point out. If you look right there at that dark blob, you'll notice it has like a red fringe around it. Okay, that red fringe is because it's got ionized hydrogen within that black cloud that's being ionized by the bright stars. Okay, the ultraviolet energy from the brighter stars. And you can see, the, you can see it in 3D. You can see that three-dimensional... Uh, edge to it. It has that little fringe. So you can see that there's thickness to it. That is really so incredible. It's not just a 2D image. And then over here we've got this dark nebula here. And this is stuff that's up here. It's in front. Okay, the bright nebula is back here. It's in the background. It's being blocked by the dark nebula up front. And that's what we're seeing right here. Is that, that dark nebula. Okay. Uh, dark nebulae are a thing in the universe. And, um, you know, thanks to E.E. E. Barnard, he came up with a uh, dark nebula catalog. So we have Barnard's catalog of dark nebulae. We have Lynn's catalog of dark nebulae as well. The LDN catalog. Uh, really interesting stuff. And we like, to, uh, we like to go to dark nebulae when we can. And when the moon's out like this, we can see it better when it's silhouetted against a beautiful bright nebula in the background. <laughs> If you look at the uh, brightest star there, a little bit upper right of center, and then look straight over at 9 o'clock from it, uh, there's a pillar right there. That's just like the pillars we see in the Pillars of Creation yep. or in uh, other emission nebula where the, uh, the clouds are being uh, beaten back by the uh, 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 those the pressure from the bright stars yeah. and it's whittling them down into those pillar shapes. Right. And the reason that they're a pillar at all is because up in the front here, uh, there's going to be areas of higher and lower density in these clouds. And like, if we look at this particular area right here, okay, this front end is actually a, a dense, a more dense area. And so when the starlight hits it, and what we should really say is when the, uh, when the uh, ultraviolet radiation is striking this area, the, the base, basically the radiation pressure is pushing the lighter material back, as Daryl pointed out. But where it's densest, it doesn't. So that actually protects the, the leeward side here of this material, and that's why this stuff doesn't go. Right, so pillars are found very often in these clusters. Uh, we'll see them in the rosette. We'll see them in the eagle. We'll see them in NGC 6822. We'll see them all over when we stare at objects in the universe like this. Um, and we're going to see a lot more of them as the winter approaches because we see them in the Orion Nebula. We see them in the Orion Complex. 
Uh, and the Orion Nebula, of course, is part of the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex, the OMCC. And we'll talk about those molecules because um, it's we come we have molecules in us. In fact, everything in this cloud represents uh, um, the materials from which, in, in part, you're made. And they were all made in the hearts of stars at one point. This dust here was made in the outer atmospheres of big red supergiants. Remember we saw those red stars in the double cluster? Well, those are red supergiants. Those red supergiants will eventually go supernova. And then boom, it's going to spread all that material back out to the interstellar medium. And perhaps generate planets and potentially life. Uh, it's at some point down the line. So, so this is nice, though, huh? This is not bad. No. Yeah. And you could imagine if you see the little dark blob right to here. the upper left of the bright star. Yes, that one. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's zoom in on that. It's, it's somewhat closer to us uh, than the uh, red pillar over on the far left is. Uh, if our point of view was a little farther to the right, it might look much the same as that red pillar does. And... Uh, the dark one where it's kind of lit edge on, as Mark noted, uh, well, if you were farther over to the right and maybe a little deeper, that it would, uh, you would see that lit up part instead of the dark part. Yeah, because this dark part is dust, okay? It's not gas, it's dust. So this black part is dust. So when we see this dust, um, it can tend to obscure the very faintly ionized hydrogen gas we see here. Right, and again, ionization is very simple. You, the the electron around the hydrogen atom is, is scoots off the atom for a period of time, and when it does, it absorbs energy, uh, the ultraviolet energy from like one of these these sets of stars here, and then when it comes back in to the atom uh, by you know undergo collisions out there and lose some energy, and then it drops back into its atom, and when it gets down to uh, a certain level called the n equals two level. Uh, as it cascades into the atom, it gives off a light as it releases energy. And that light tends to be, well, as you guessed it, red. That predominant, the predominant transition in the hydrogen atom is the one that makes what's called hydrogen alpha, which is this. Now, there is a hydrogen beta, okay, transition, and the hydrogen beta line is blue, Okay, but we don't see blue here because hydrogen alpha dominates. So there is the Pac-Man. It is a stunning... Let's actually, for the moment, let's just leave it like this and let's, let's move the telescope out of the way and maximize this here. Okay, just so we can get a good look at this. I think this is kind of cool. I don't know, even with the, with the waning, uh, waxing gibbous moon, I think this is one of the best Pac-Mans we've seen. Again, this is the first time I'm imaging it with this camera, however. Uh, this new camera is literally tuned to this particular telescope for uh, the best images possible. The rating with this camera, I think, for our optical system is uh, exceptional. Yeah, look at the detail in there. This this is with the other camera we kind of saw this detail, but the nebula was literally uh, just about this big with the other uh, telescope. Uh, sorry, with the other uh, camera. The camera settings will dictate the size of the uh, field too, and uh, the size of the sensor, how many pixels it has. This sensor has many more pixels than the previous camera. And it's a smaller field of view with that many more pixels packed in. So we get more detail per square, you know, per arc second uh, in an image. It's pretty cool. And Cosmic Ray, I want to give you credit for that. Thanks for pointing that out. E.E. E. Barnard himself discovered uh, NGC 281. If you look closely, uh, the upper part of the nebula uh, around 
the clusters and the bright star there. Uh, you see again what I, I mentioned the other night that uh, you can see where the uh, pressure from the bright stars has kind of formed a cavity in there where it's bright around the edges, but then it's a little, uh, just a little darker in the in the middle mm -hmm. of that cavity. Yep. Again, much like what we see in the rosette and other nebulas. Yeah, like we look at the elephant's trunk. Um, hot young stars tend to make, uh, they tend to push the gas away, and um, uh, along with making pillars, <clears throat> as Daryl was saying, they also will carve out a cavity around them um, in some cases and in many cases. So they tend to empty out the area directly around them and push all that material out. Uh, now, that also causes uh, more starbirth to occur, <clears throat> which is kind of interesting, you know? Welcome back, Isabella. She got more coffee. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so... Now, here's, here's what's interesting. This image you're seeing here, this is the universe live in real time. You're seeing it as it is right this second, and uh, you're seeing it in a way that I... I kind of tend to think is unprecedented there's really no one else doing this to show you this there's really no one doing this so uh you know we want to sky tour live stream and and sky tour live.org we want to show you the universe um in ways you've just never seen it before and those ways are well live like this that's our motto live the universe live in real time Man, it's beautiful. That really is pretty. Yes. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, save this. There's uh, 33 frames we've stacked with no loss. Very still night. Same exactly as seen. There we go. Beautiful. Okay, so let's now... Uh, dock our system back in there and I want to bring back the telescope bring that back <clears throat> okay oh, that's really pretty this will make a, a gorgeous highly processed image I think Daryl yeah I do Michael, uh, what materials are best for different lenses, laser lenses, telescope lenses, glass, very high quality glass. Uh, uh, when you get into, I know you asked about optics the other night, lenses and mirrors. Uh, I'm afraid I didn't give you a very good answer. Uh, what you want is optical grade glass, which is ultra pure, ultra clear. Uh, then they often will apply special thin film coatings on the surfaces of the glass. Uh, some are for uh, anti-reflection uh, and sometimes for filtration and stuff like that. Uh, basically, just uh, really, really pure glass is the best thing to make uh, optics out of. Now, back in the old days, uh, mm -hmm. metal like uh, the Earl of Ross and stuff, uh, Herschel, yeah. Uh, they made their mirrors out of metal, as Mark said. It's called speculum metal. It, uh, I forget what all was in it. Uh, le uh, not lead. Uh, tin. Yeah, tin. Um, I, I copper. forget. No, I don't remember, Daryl, but I can tell you this. Uh, whenever, uh, uh, whenever William Herschel went out to observe with his big telescope, 42-inch telescope, or 43, I think, um, he had to polish the mirror every single time. Yeah. Because it, it tarnished in, in just hours. So it was tough to actually do that. Now, remember, they couldn't photograph anything at that time. It was all observational. So <clears throat> it's pretty cool what they learned just by observation. But 
again, they're constrained by the aperture and the quality of their instrumentation. So they couldn't see um, details like this at all. This was a fuzzy patch. You know, as Kazakh Gray pointed out earlier, uh, you know, E.E. E. Barnard is the guy that discovered it. <clears throat> all right. So this is up on the... Uh, this is up on the server probably as we speak. So we'll get out of this now. Really pretty. And for a waxing gibbous moon, not a bad image at all. For a faint nebula. Now we're gonna go to another one that I want to go to. And I'm first gonna bring us back down to uh Right. Michael, uh, to expand a bit on what I was saying, uh, well, first you need really pure, high-grade optical quality glass. The next thing you need is very precisely made surfaces, the curves on the surfaces, where you're getting down to like a billionth of an inch. The precision of the uh, curves they generate in the glass in the old days, I used to do that by rubbing two pieces of glass together and walking in circles. Uh, that's how they shape the mirrors, the concavity, you know, the parabolic mirrors, or spherical mirrors as the case would be, yeah. is uh, they have to generate the right curve on the face of the glass. And one reason they like mirrors, especially for bigger telescopes, uh, for reflectors is you only have to curve one side of the piece of glass to a certain shape, and then you uh, <laughs> apply aluminum or uh, whatever nowadays to silver the surface to uh, you know make the mirror reflective. With lenses, uh, lens-type telescopes, really good ones are called apochromats, and uh, classic apochromats will have three lenses in them, You'll see them often stacked together at the uh, front end of the telescope. And each of those lenses uh, is to control different color, like red, green, and blue, is to build the classic uh, three-lens apochromat. And each lens has two precisely curved surfaces to make a lens out of it, okay? So you can generate one curved surface on a reflector, or you might have to have uh, six curved surfaces, precisely curved surfaces on an apochromat. And that's why really nice big refractor telescopes cost a whole lot more than large reflectors. Yeah. And I'll leave it right there. And costly they are. Costly they are. Okay, we're moving to our next object here. It should be right there. One other thing, uh, as far as generating curves on glass, uh, nowadays, uh, down at the University of Arizona, they've had a, a mirror-making lab for years down there. Oh, yeah, in the basement. Yeah, where they came up with the idea of uh, building an oven mm. that rotates, that spins. They load the glass in the mold for the mirror, and they turn on the oven, and they start spinning it. They spin it at a certain speed, and uh, <clears throat> centrifugal <throat> force generates that curve automatically the basic shape yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, once they got the curve they start uh, lowering the temperature very slowly uh, so they don't generate any stresses in the uh, cooling glass yeah and really after cool. it's spun down long enough it's annealed and uh, hey you've got a mirror they can do the fine grinding on I think that's really cool Mind forked, what's up? 
I like her. She was fun. Met her in Roswell a couple times now. She runs around like crazy. Mind Fork. She's everywhere. You know, really passionate lady, I'll tell you. Okay, we are doing a shot here of the Gamma Cassiopeia Nebula <clears throat> near the star Navi. So that's the previous one. We're going to delete that. And then we now will get our next shot that will come in. This is cool. Navi, uh, the, the Gamma Cass Nebula is really pretty. And what I wanna, the reason I want to show you this one <coughs> is because it has a, uh, a couple different facets that are different from what we saw in the Pac-Man. And the formation process was different. I think um, if we're not getting them, we're not passing our FWHAS. -E. <coughs> we're not passing our, our test here, so we got to let that settle out. I meant to ask you about Gamma Cassiopeia. Uh, okay. Surely we've looked at it before, haven't we? <coughs> yes, we have. Uh, APOD, Astrophoto of the Day. Had an outstanding image of uh, Kim Cass recently. Okay. I raised the uh, full width half maximum uh, minimum size just enough to start getting some data, see how it looks. All right, let's see what this looks like. Oh, yeah, look at that. I want to say it was back around uh, Halloween they showed that. Okay, well, there is there it is, and <clears throat> you'll see that it's going to look a lot better than that here soon. And that's one image. Our curves are pretty well lined up. Let me just do some quick processing here. That's going to make it do that, yep. And what I'll do is... Okay, now... <clears throat> This this white line here is the average of our three red, green, and blue curves. And that average curve, <coughs> uh, this, this, the uh, average curve is being white. That's where our dark begins. If we, this is the dark, uh, the level, the black level. So if we move to the left, we're going to get more of the lighter moonlit type area, okay? Uh, simulating light pollution. But if we come in here, we're going we right up to the curve. We get right to near the top. That's about as dark as we typically want to go. But look at all this nebula out here. There's a lot of nebula out here. And if we pull this in, we're going to do what's called compress the data, meaning squeeze all that data. And so you can see now what's really here in here. And we're going to get to that in a little bit uh, as we allow this to come in over time. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to, uh, I need to uh, get right back. I'll have to, uh, take a momentary break. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. I shall return. Bear with me, folks. Uh, I can show you the Gamma Cass A-Pod image. It's absolutely, it's, it's a very striking picture. I don't want to steal Mark's thunder here. Uh, I'll post a link in the chat. Really an amazing image. It's, uh, it's rotated clockwise about 90 degrees, I think, to... Uh, Mark's image. Give me just a second. Uh, his telescope here 
uh, as he continues uh, stacking images, uh, all that nebulosity you see to the upper left and above uh, the bright star gamma cast there, uh, that will build up more uh, showing the same things that that APOD image shows. APOD was doing kind of a Halloween thing back around Halloween, and uh, they showed this, and they showed the Ghost Nebula also, which is really trip, trippy looking too. Look like little little ghosts down in the cloud. I'm afraid I don't, I don't quite have the gift to gab that Mark does. Uh, sounds like he's back, though. I'll let him do the talking. Did somebody ask something? No. Oh, okay. Just trying to entertain people while you were gone. All right, that's fair. At least I didn't sing. <laughs> yeah, you did one time. Uh, I used to sing sometimes when you still had to go outside <clears throat> to your observatory at your home. Yeah. And, uh, I would uh, sing songs to the audience while you were gone. <laughs> that was Sky Tour 1. I don't do that. STLS anymore. East. Yeah. Hey, Rascally Rabbit's with us. Hey there. All right, let's, uh, let's try to pull some data out here. Okay, dark in the background. Look at this. So you can see already a couple of interesting things are occurring in this uh, nebula. All right, and first of all, you see that it's sort of blue. All right, and it has a little red fringe, and then it's red right here. Now uh, I don't know the distance of Navi, which is gamma cast, to this nebula, but I assume. Navi is probably causing the ionization of the hydrogen gas in here, <clears throat> which is causing it to uh, glow like this. So, I think that's what's going on. And then this blue, this is uh, what we call a reflection nebula. There's blue dust. Uh, I'm sorry, there's black dust in here like the dust we saw in the Pac-Man Nebula. And what happens is it scatters the blue light coming from Navi. So we end up seeing uh, a blue cast to this nebula because the blue light is getting reflected in all directions in the same way that our sky is blue because the molecules are scattering the blue light from the sun in all directions. Right. So the sun looks a little bit more yellow than it really is uh, in the sky. And when it's on the horizon, it's going through a lot of air and a lot more blue light is getting scattered. So the sun looks red. That's why our sunsets are always so beautiful. This is nice. Let's see what our track record has been on the... Okay, so I set it to 7.24, and you see where the telescope's pointing? It's kind of pointing uh, out of the back. We're getting buffeted by a little bit of wind right now, so that explains why we're not getting um, as many green frames, that is to say good frames, but the frames we do get are perfect, and so we don't get any more elongated stars. That is a thing of the past now. The halos you see, well, we have a fast optical system. It runs at F2, all right? And so a bright star will induce these artifacts. Now, when we do our processing, we can get rid of those. But I think that, uh, I think that, unfortunately, if you want an F2 system that shows you nebulae like this, <clears throat> you have to live with halos like that.
But you can see this vast nebula taking shape here. Vast nebula out here. All that. Very subtle. The brightest part is this right here. This thing you might be able to see in a large telescope, but these... Um, no, not visually. This one you might see visually in a big telescope with the right filter. <clears throat> you thought turkeys could fly, Daryl? Les Nesman thought turkeys could fly. Well, I kind of thought turkeys could fly. They were just too big to fly. They were fat uh, enough. Well, I... Rascally Rabbit said uh, WKRP in Cincinnati has a turkey giveaway this Thursday at Wilson's Market. <laughs> and that's where that came from. Okay. Actually, wild turkeys can fly quite well. Not the domesticated fat ones. Yeah. They're piled on with the fat. The history guy on YouTube, he does some pretty entertaining stuff. Uh, he did the uh, history of turkeys a couple of days ago. It's pretty funny. Really? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I increased our FWHM limit to 7.41. Let's see if we can just get a few more good images here. Wind picking up? Yeah. Yeah, so 7.16 is good. I'll drop it back down just a little bit. Now, the history guy even explained how, uh, why we call them turkeys. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, the name came from the English. Uh, they had Mediterranean and Near Eastern traders coming to England. Okay. And uh, the bird, the turkey, had spread from the Americas uh, all over uh, uh, places in Europe and uh, the Middle East or the Near East and uh, Africa, I think. And uh, uh, these traders were coming from uh, the Eastern Mediterranean area, and uh, they brought these birds and... Well, because of the traders, they called them uh, turkeys. Really? Because they came, they came from that part of the country. <laughs> That's funny. So there you see it. Look at that, guys. Now this nebula, you can see it's quite an extensive nebula. This, uh, this blue thing you see right here, that is not a nebula. That's actually an, uh, an artifact of this bright star. Um, and we see that. And... Many times you'll see, like in uh, Google Universe or Google Space, whatever that is, you'll see that it has these little weird blue blotches every now and then in the sky. And what those are are, again, related to the way the photos were taken. And so when you see a bright star, you see it has these faint rings around it. Well, that right there is going to be an internal lens reflection in our camera that ends up on the sensor. So, unfortunately, that does not mean that um, there's a blue nebula out there that's that bright. Mm. Dr. Becky on YouTube talked the other day how uh, they're seeing uh, blue or purple blobs in uh, images from the new Euclid telescope. Yeah, different different type of thing, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, listen. This is we're doing visual astronomy right now. We're not doing any um, uh, uh, photometry, you know, photon counting. We're not doing any narrow band photography, which is still visual. Um, uh, I'll quickly explain what narrow band photography is. If you put a filter that's sensitive to this blue part of the nebula, and a filter that sensitive to this red part here they may not be the same filter so you generally have a hydrogen alpha filter you have a sulfur 2 filter 
and you have an oxygen 3 filter. The oxygen 3 will be sensitive to this greenish blue stuff that you see when oxygen gets ionized. This is just a reflection nebula, so there's no ionization going on here, but that's the uh, filter that would pick up most of that. Um, and then uh, if you uh, look at the way nebulae are built, if you use these narrow band filters, they're just they just basically bring in only this, only this, okay, and only that blue, and only this fringe here. No, you'd still see the stars, but you're looking at a, a much tighter bandwidth. It takes a lot longer to take the pictures, and you got to do, say, the H-alpha filter and do 20 exposures of the H-alpha, 20 exposures of the O3, 20 exposures of the sulfur 2 and combine them later what we're doing is we're doing all of them at once and we're combining them all at once uh, to show you a final result all at once so that's something that we're, we're doing here that's that's why we're, we're seeing it just like this so in any case, um, this is really pretty so far. We have uh, 20 stacked and 16 ignored. So you can see that our filtering system works very well. We will never have a bad photograph again. We'll never be throwing away a photograph again. Let's put it that way. I noticed uh, that off color area up at about 12 o'clock from the star uh, I think he called it blue yeah so you're saying that's just reflection nebulosity yeah that's actually a reflection nebula right behind an ionized uh, cloud of hydrogen <clears throat> it's really pretty Isabella says, I'd rather have chicken. Even better, yeah. a steak. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's soften this a bit. Add some contrast. See that? Now that you can see the contrast better. Wow, that's nice. Have you seen the price of steak nowadays, though? Is it expensive? I don't eat steak. Uh, uh, red, uh, yes, uh, beef <clears throat> prices are through the roof. Mm. And turkey's actually cheap this year. Yeah, I remember turkey last year was pretty expensive. My grocery had butter balls for 97 cents a pound, and their premium house brand was uh, 87 cents a pound. Wow. <laughs> Imagine growing up and you're a bird and you're called a butterball. It's like, oh man. What kind of name is that? <laughs> uh, there's a story behind that. Uh, there's a good series on History Channel. Uh, it started out with the men who built America, you know. You probably saw that about all yeah. the. Uh, uh, millionaires back in the uh, late 1800s. In the railroads and all that, yeah. Right. And uh, they've expanded a lot now to where they have a good series called The Food That Built America. Oh. And uh, one, they showed it just recently. It's about Thanksgiving and the foods at Thanksgiving. And they talked about turkeys and what it took to get turkeys out on the uh, mass market and get people to buy them and eat them. Uh used to be if you wanted a turkey you got a fresh one and you know never never frozen and mm -hmm. the whole thing was about uh, what they went through to uh, make frozen turkeys palatable to people huh. and that was injecting them with fluids and butter and stuff and that's where a butterball came from Ew. it's how they process the bird and get it ready for people to cook it wow so it's not dry and tasteless. Yeah, anyway, I, 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 I digress. 
episode. No, that's actually interesting. I, I, uh, yeah, I'm gonna start calling you Norm. <laughs> Norm. You mean Cliff? Or Cliff? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Well, I say that. There's a little known myself. fact there that. Uh, <laughs> oh, here we go, Cliff. <laughs> no, that's cool. I didn't know that about butterballs. Uh, uh all those shows. Uh, some are really interesting. The foods that built America, and uh, <clears throat> they have the toys that built America. Some of those are really interesting, also. Wow. That's where your cool. favorite toys came from? Yeah. Yeah, your favorite toys you can no longer have because they're now deemed too dangerous, like lawn darts. <laughs> yeah. Remember lawn darts? Holy cow. Look at this beautiful detail in here. That was invisible to us with the last camera right here. That was not visible. Now it's here. That's really pretty. Let's kick it over the just a bit just to open this up make it look a little brighter it's going to knock out the brightness on this just a tad okay that's 30 images of the Gambacast Nebula and the same exactly a scene this will be the uh, uh, last stream before uh, Thanksgiving guys not the last stream don't say that no last stream before Thanksgiving um, and uh, I do want to thank uh, Isabella for being here with us and doing all that she does to keep us going in the background I want to thank her for those wonderful videos she's done with Robin Robin Curtis um, Daryl I want to thank you for uh, jumping in at a moment's notice like today I gave him 15 minutes notice and said I think I'm going to stream tonight and he said what time <laughs> and he was like that's only 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And, and we compromised. We Instead of 9.45, he said 9, 9.55? Oh, okay. Yeah. I I'm had things to get done before the show started. Of course. Of course. But hey, look, this is this is rapidly becoming everybody's favorite TV show to stick up on their uh, big screen and, and watch the universe unfold live before them. Um, I just... Uh, it's all like a... A hazy dream. I, I, as a kid, I imagined having a telescope I could control from far away. And I even began building for a telescope I had in a childhood observatory in the backyard I was building, which I never finished. I would put my telescope way in the backyard and run a control all the way into the house. And I would control it from in the house. But, of course, I then had to run out and look through the eyepiece to see what was in it. <laughs> You know, but the idea of controlling it long distance was was in my head ever since I was a kid, um, and the leaps and bounds that we've taken to get to where we are now are stupendous. Um, so uh, to to run this now from over twenty five hundred miles away, uh, it seems like a, a no big deal, yet it's a huge deal. You know. A huge deal. I'm amazed that we can do it, but we can. So, you guys like this uh, Gamma Cast Nebula? Interesting to see what it looks like once you get it processed. Yeah, and when we process these, what we do, guys, is we remove the stars and we process only the nebulae. Why do we do that? Because you see the stars that are sitting in front of the nebula right here? If we process the nebula, those little stars are going to get processed too. And it can make them bloated and big and uh, rather ugly. So we actually take them out and put them on a separate layer entirely. Okay? And then we just work on the nebula. And we add the stars back in. But we don't add the stars back in just the way they were. We actually take the star layer... And we get rid of all the noise in it. See all this noise in here? You can see it. It's, it's sort of like a... It looks like a, a f like a foam in between the stars. Like a you know, F-O-A-M foam. You know. Well, that's going to go because that's partly in this nebula here. And it's partly in the background stars. And we're going to remove that entirely, leaving only the data. Now, what you notice about this, this now, now that we've zoomed in like this... You can see now pretty clearly that this is a dark patch of nebula right here. 
This is a dark wall. All right. And on the other side of this dark wall is this reflection nebula. This is in 3D. Um, you know, we don't know which end is farther, which end is closer. But it's undoubtedly very complex. But look at that. Isn't that pretty? And you can see the nebula way easier when we actually remove the stars. Then you see only the nebula. And then it becomes very obvious. And uh, those are the starless ones that we will sometimes do and show you the difference. I may, I might, maybe I'll, when I, I'll process this, I'll stick it up on, on Facebook and I'll do it with and without stars so people can see the difference and, and see how that all works. Yeah. Louis Ta, welcome, man. And he says it's first time seeing this nebula. Yeah, you know what this is? This is in a constellation that you undoubtedly know all about. And if I go back to our Stellarium, all right, and look, it's in Cassiopeia. It's right in the center of Cassiopeia. But who would have figured? Who would have known? Right? Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah, there's even a galaxy in there. Uh, and it's this galaxy right here. Uh, and this galaxy is a, what's called a starburst galaxy. Uh, LBN 591 or PGC 1305. Uh, they tend to be uh, pretty faint and small. So not, uh, not too exciting to look at generally. Uh, but with focal length and a, a little bit more magnification it might look pretty cool when we look at that image uh, this one yes uh, gamma cast there uh, the nebulosity is about three or four light years from the star yeah thank you for putting that in there yeah this uh, this nebulous detail <clears throat> is uh, definitely, you know, Gamma Cast or Navi, N-A-V-I, is actually illuminating and, and causing this blue uh, coloration here from the dust that's uh, reflecting the blue light from Navi. But then you can see here, now that we've been going a while, you can see that there's complexity now behind this. What looked like a pointy thing is now more of a solid thing, and it has a blue... Uh, it has a blue cast to it as well. We're starting to pick up the fact that this is also a uh, a region where there is also dark nebula, and that's also uh, scattering the blue light from Navi. Dimmer red area above that, uh, right there, and it has a blue component as well. Yes, looks almost purple. Yeah. <clears throat> now a little uh, rule of thumb if we wanted to take a picture okay let's just zoom in on, on this the brightest part of the Gamma Cast Nebula if we wanted to take a picture of just this thing right here and get it perfect okay and as I can see our focus is off just a tad if we wanted to get this perfect and get rid of all the noise we see in here the rule of thumb is you basically to cut the noise in half you have to double the number of exposures we've done 45 if I let this go for another two hours all right or an hour okay and did it that way and ended up with 90 exposures then this noise would be half this amount uh, so that's the astronomical rule of thumb you double the exposure to have the noise But we're not going to do that on a waxing gibbous moonlight knit, a moonlit night. I was going to say moonlight knit. <laughs> moonlit night. All right. Okay, one last save, and then I think we'll be done for tonight. All righty. Well, there it is. The Gamma Cast Nebula, guys ends our evening it's uh, not as long as other streams but that's okay we've got a lot to do this week and 
lots of people to deliver Thanksgiving to. Louis Toss says, looks like a shark's tooth. In fact, it does. That's a, I, I look at this and I've thought of that myself, Louis. That's a really good observation. Wow, that's nice. Yeah. Genghis says, kind of iridescent in a way. Because of the coloration, it certainly looks weird, doesn't it? All right. Well, look, guys, thank you so much for joining us on this busy Thanksgiving week. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to all of you. And happy Thanksgiving to you, Daryl. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you. And to all of our friends in Sky Tour live stream, thanks so much for coming out. You can look for this. I'll do one more save. You can look for this up on the server in just a few minutes. Yeah. And uh, also, if you get a chance, all right, head up to, head up here. Why don't you go, if you want to have some nice Christmas presents, you want to get some really cool Christmas presents, go to our Etsy store called Sky Tour Shop. And all the highly processed images that we have on lamps, blankets, uh, mouse pads, uh, cups, mugs, everything. Uh, it's stunning. It's stunning. To see just uh, how many of these we could have put up there. We've got like almost 50 products up there. Coasters. Uh, it's just nice. So if you're looking for some interesting and unique Christmas presents, go check it out, will you? And uh, you guys have a good holiday. Good Thanksgiving. And we will see you on the very, very next time we go live. Which will be just after Thanksgiving when the moon will uh, be just past full. All right, so you guys have a good night, and we'll see you on the flip-flop, and make sure when you go outside, you keep looking up. Good night. Good night, everybody.